We are in the book of Genesis. We uh, anticipate doing it in 12 sessions, and we're in the 21st of those uh, 24 sessions. And uh, we're, going to, we're now getting into the story of Joseph. We're going to deal with chapters 37 through 40 tonight. And uh, they, that sounds like a lot, but they're actually pretty short chapters. And uh, we've been, of course, in the book of Genesis, part one, we went through 14 sessions for that portion of the book of Genesis that some people call prehistory, the first 11 chapters. Uh, but we sort of shifted gears at chapter 12 as we got into the narrative of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so on. You'll probably notice as we go from session 20 through t- to 21, we're going to shift gears again. We're going to have what really should be a shooting script. I mean, it's just an incredible drama. Story of Joseph. In any of several different dimensions, it's just a captivating narrative. And uh, it has many aspects to it. First of all, it's just an enjoyable story. A story of betrayal, and then, and then uh, uh, the, the, the ousted brother becomes the prime minister of the world, and, and so forth. And it all, all of this accomplishes God's purpose in a, an amazing way. But it's also an exciting narrative. I'm going to give you a test in a sense, not a written one, but you should give yourself a written test because it will become obvious as you embrace the story of Joseph that there are peculiar parallels. And um, I have not really, I tried not to overemphasize that as we've gone through the earlier parts of Genesis. Because if you're going just through lightly the first time, it may sound a little strange. But when you go through it next time, the book of Genesis, when you read it, I want you to be sensitive to the fact that the Holy Spirit deliberately has embroidered this with parallels to Jesus Christ. In fact, I've made the statement many times, you'll find Jesus Christ on every page in Genesis. The amazing thing about Genesis isn't the creation all that. That's fun, sure. But is that you'll find analogies, types, figures of speech that point to the Messiah on every page. That's really what it's all about. In in the story of Joseph, if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you a challenge. In addition to the normal notes you might be taking on another place, start making a list of the parallels between Joseph and Jesus Christ. Arthur W. Pink lists over a hundred. And you may say, well, that's going a little too far, and maybe it is, but but, uh, you'll discover. I'll I'll highlight a few of those. I won't do too many because it it can distract the the, the mainstream of the study. But also, I'll mention a few to give you the flavor of it. And it's it's amazing. The more you see, the more you will see. At first, it sounds strange until you start looking for them. When you start looking for them, some of them are quite astonishing. But we're going to spend, we spent two sessions on Abraham, two sessions on Isaac, and two sessions on Jacob. We're going to spend three on Joseph. And that will leave us the one to handle the prophetic announcements of Jacob to the 12 tribes at the end of the book. And uh, it'll be a good, ra- the last session will be a wrap-up uh, in many ways. And so, so uh, we are going to go to chapter 37. This is the famous chapter of where jo- this young Joseph has these dreams that become prophetic. They become prophetic not only for the family... They become prophetic for you and me because without one of those dreams, you will not understand Revelation 12. It astonishes me to see how many commentaries in the book of Revelation totally miss the the implication of chapter 12 because they haven't read chapter 37. Because Jacob himself interprets chapter 12 of Revelation for you. I'll show you when we get there. Then we'll talk about this bizarre episode in Genesis 38. In fact, many commentaries sort of treat it like something that's been inserted here because it's sort of it's out of the step, the pace of Joseph. He has his dreams. He gets betrayed, sent to Egypt. You know all that story. That's forthcoming. Here's this bizarre chapter where Judah has this tragic mess with his daughter-in-law. But you're going to be startled with the implications of that. Why is it here? For lots of reasons, some of which may surprise you. And then, of course, you know the story. Joseph gets betrayed by his brothers and gets imprisoned in Egypt. And, uh, and uh, he's, we'll leave him there until next session, where it all gets kind of exciting. But chapter 37. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. I might mention, speaking of Jacob, because we're going to shift now talking about Joseph. But before I leave Jacob, we, last time we talked about Jacob wrestling and uh, there were many comments afterwards as we were having a little coffee afterwards. Um, I may not have emphasized that. Some people think that, well, that wrestling was maybe spiritual or a vision or just a bad dream or something. And uh, there are even commentators that take that view. Wait a minute, guys. Dreams don't get your hips dislocated. 
he was physically wrestling. And so uh, I don't want to re revisit all of that, but I just want to underscore for your notes to go back and look at that. That is a very, very interesting, strange thing. Well, well but in any case, we're going to um, see that uh, Jacob here is dwelling in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. And uh, it's, uh, 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 he had no chiefs. He had his, he had his 11 sons. And, uh, but he's a sojourner. He's a stranger in this land. And uh, so uh, it's a, a secular worldly greatness usually comes more swiftly than spiritual greatness. It took Jacob quite a time to really uh, get his act together. That's what that wrestling episode really is in some sense a peak, a peak of. But uh, we now find that uh, here are the generations in verse 2 of, of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. Let's remember he is 17. At the, at the time that we're going to see these uh, young events. He's young, and yet in their, their culture, that's uh, almost, you're not fully grown, but close. Anyway, Joseph, being 17 years of old, and was feeding the flock with his brethren. And uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Hebrew implies oversight, or superintendence uh, is implied. And uh, this, he's apparently the post of it as a chief shepherd. Uh, may either be because he was favored by Jacob because he was the son of his favored wife. You understand there's sort of three levels. There are the sons of the concubines. They're always subordinate to Leah and Rachel. But even among the, the direct sons of Leah and Rachel, Rachel's sons were more dear to Jacob because he loved Rachel so intensely. So that may be one of the reasons. But also, this guy was, some people call him a tattletale, but he was very candid in reporting to the father the sins of the sons of the concubines. I get the impression that they were all a pretty bad bunch, but the sons of the concubines were particularly sort of the out, considered outsiders by the others. You can see, you get the feeling of it. So the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, the father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now you can, it's cause and effect here. You can say, well, he brought the report because he was, in char he was put in charge by Jacob. That's, that's apparently true. And the flip side is also that's maybe one reason he's in charge because he was candid, let Jacob know what the, what the score really was. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of presentations of Jacob make him quite a tattletale. Um, you do get the impression from the subsequent verses that he was pretty ingenuous. He's pretty naive about the way he said things. He didn't, he didn't allow for the, the, the reactions of the people to his study, as you'll see in a minute. Anyway, get to verse 3. Now Israel, that is uh, Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. This, um, this is a translational problem that no one has really quite resolved. You'll never separate the myths of the coat of many colors with, from the reality. So I'm not going to badger this too much, but the, the word in the Hebrew that implies it was of many colors has, is, is very enigmatic. Some scholars feel it was a patchwork of many colored cloths because dyes were, the dye technology was not where we're used to it today. It's not like you have a coat of many colors by other cleverness or things. So the, the implication would be it was a patchwork of many, many colored cloths. That's many people think that. And clearly the intent here, it's richly ornamented. But it also turns out that the, the, ter the term can also mean a coat with sleeves. Most of the tunics did not have sleeves. And it was a coat with sleeves. And so, strangely enough, the main point, though, is, is that he had, if he had a long sleeve robe, the intent was that whatever it was, it was special. It was unique. It was distinctive. And uh, it's interesting that uh, 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 Jacob was probably highlighting the fact that it would be through that son that the divine blessings would flow. And that's true. But that very robe was destined to be covered with blood to speak of Joseph's apparent death later. And there's an irony brewing here because Jacob cheated his father with, the, with a similar stunt. So there's an, there's an irony here brewing. I don't, I don't leave it for a punchline. I want you to sense it as it comes, you see. But anyway, so we have this famous coat of many colors. And whether it's many colors or long-sleeved or whatever, clearly it's highly ornamented and a very key uh, uh, thing and clearly indicates that Jacob favored him above all the rest. 
and because uh, he was the firstborn of Rachel, the son of his old age, and he also apparently was a cool guy. He also apparently was very good looking, partly because he's from Rachel, who was also very good looking. And so that'll come to be uh, something that'll haunt him uh, a little bit later. But it's interesting if you study this in a pragmatic sense, uh, the, these chapters of Genesis we've been in highlight the dangers that come from parental favoritism among the children. All the way back, we see that same uh, thing happening. And I suspect we all, in various ways, are guilty of that. But we need to guard against that. Because that's, I think, one of, the, one of the, the practical lessons that come out of all of this. But anyway, uh, getting to verse 4, when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, that's something, you know, you can't keep a secret. It shows up. The kids know that. They see it even when it's not there. You know. um, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Okay, that's the background. Now we have this first of two episodes. Joseph dreamed a dream. Okay, he can't help that. But then he ingenuously told his brothers, hey, guess what dream I had last night, guys. Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it his brethren. And they hated him yet the more. You want to understand why? Listen to the dream. He said, he said to them, here I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. Okay? And uh, by the way, I, I should mention something else. Um, these, it's interesting through the scripture uh, how God uses dreams. That doesn't mean some dream you have is necessarily from God. Don't, miss it. You can, don't carry this too far. But at the same time, it's clear that God did use that mechanism several times. And uh, he usually did it in the land of the pagans. And uh, he announced to uh, uh, Abraham in a dream that the Egyptian bondage was going to take place back in chapter 15, you may recall. Um, he promised his protection to Jacob uh, in a sojourn in, uh, with Laban in chapter 28 and so forth. And now we're going to see a couple of dreams in which it's going to lay out the future of Israel in the world. So he says, uh, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. That's in this dream. They're binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf ro arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my, chi my sheaf. Now that went over great, you know. I mean, it didn't take a lot of insight to try to infer what this is trying to communicate. His brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? They got the message, you know. Or, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him uh, yet the more for his dreams and for his words. You can't help but sort of get the impression the kid was a little naive. Having the dreams one thing, you know, and sharing it with mom would be great. But, and maybe even with dad under the right circumstances, but not to your sibling rivals. Come on, guys. In any case, if you're going to do it once, let's do it again. He dreamed yet another dream. <laughs> And he told his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now this time, he even got dad upset. Okay? And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, Notice what Jacob says. What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee on the earth? Jacob recognized in the idioms of the dream that the eleven stars represented his brothers, but the sun and the moon was Jacob and his wife in the, in the symbolism of the dream. Remember that. Um, because when you get to Genesis, uh, when you get to Revelation, Chapter 12. By the way, something else you can take on as a student assignment sometime is make a list of the parallels between Genesis and Revelation. Everything that starts in Re Genesis, and that's almost everything, has its climax in Revelation. The two books almost are designed side by side. Everything that started is finished, and it links. But in, Ge in Revelation chapter 12, there is a summary of the seed of the woman. And it's, it speaks of some personages, and one of the principal personages is a woman with 12 stars and uh, sun and the moon at her feet and so forth. And some people say, well, that's the zodiac. And other people think, well, that's the church. Well, if that's, that, that woman is the church in Revelation, she's in trouble because she's pregnant. Church is supposed to be the virgin bride, right? And, of course, the, the woman gives birth to the child, a man-child. 
And, uh, but here, Jacob really, every, everything in Revelation is in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in Scripture. That makes it such a fabulous treasure hunt to go through those things. But anyway, you can link this, if you will, to Revelation 12. We'll move on here. And he told it to his father and his brethren. Oh, I got that. Okay. And uh, Jacob interprets it for us. And then in verse 11, And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. This, to me, echoes the same thing that Mary did. When, there was, when she got that, when he was 12 years old, and he was at the temple and so forth, she kept, she, the last little line there, he, she kept these things in her heart. So it's kind of a strange episode, but she recognized there was more there than meets the eye. And Jacob, I think, uh, pondered this too. Because on one hand, he, was, he, he apparently sort of joins his brethren in being, you know, in uh, being uh, confronted with this uh, uh, thing on the one hand. On the other hand, he, he observed it, mulled it over, reflected on it, and so forth. And uh, so, but this all is, both dreams obviously reflect the elevation of Joseph over the house of Jacob. Indeed, he will be, in some, both in a secular sense and some other ways. His brethren went, now that's changing, we don't know how much time slips by here, but anyway, his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Now, Shechem is about, uh, is about 50 miles north uh, of Hebron, and, uh, or it's the valley of Hebron, it's going from there to, uh, to Shechem, is about 50 miles, and we're going to encounter another village called Dothan, which is yet another 15 miles. So there's a 65-mile distance here which is uh, not, it's non-trivial. The Valley of Shechem is very, uh, was very known for abundance of water, and uh, uh, so they, it took them at least 20 hours to get there, especially if they're going with sheep and so forth. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of conjectures. Why did they go up there? One is that for the availability of water, and, and uh, one reason they went out 15 miles further is they probably weren't too popular in Shechem. If you recall what Benjamin did because of Dinah back a chapter or so ago. Anyway... So Israel, or Jacob, said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. He said to him, Here am I. He said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he went out, so he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Glibly said, but you're talking, you know, several days. And, uh, and a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, says, what seekest, thou? what seekest thou? He said, I seek my brother, and tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. The man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw them afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. They are upset. They probably are upset because they didn't like him in the first place. But they also probably assume that they better do that or he will be over them. You follow me? And they said to one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. The Hebrew actually is the master of dreams, cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast had devoured him. And we shall see what shall, come, what shall become of his dreams. See, part of this rivalry thing is the dynamic here as well as the interpersonal thing. And uh, so remember these guys plotted before to kill the uh, Shechemites to revenge their sister, remember? Uh, back in chapter 34. And uh, now they're going to, they're plotting to kill their own brother. This all, you know, these, these are bad guys. Um, it's in, in uh, John's first epistle, 1 John chapter 3, it makes reference to this. It says, speaking of him, not as Cain, as who, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you, is John's point. We should not be surprised that the world hates us for lots of reasons, and uh, some of them in parallel to the situation here, some not. But in any case, uh, so they're, 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 considered, you know, they're considered rivals. Now, Reuben who is the eldest, he heard it, and he delivered them out of their hands. He said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, 
and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. In other words, Reuben is suggesting instead of killing, let's just throw him in this pit. And what's implied here is that Reuben figured he could sneak back later and get him and send him home, save his life. So that, that's to his credit, at least, that he, at least uh, that was his concept. And so um, um, this pit, by the way, was probably an empty cistern. It's, you figure just a, di you, you, a pit, you can figure he could climb out. No, a cistern is probably like what it was. The, the land is replete with cisterns because water is so precious. And so when it did rain, they got a cistern. Here's a, a cistern that is dry that they threw him into. And uh, it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. They took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So they took his fancy tunic, and uh, they're going to use that as a, a mechanism to convince the father he's been killed. And uh, uh, they, they, they uh, have him in this pit. They sat down to eat bread. They lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh and going to carry it down to Egypt. These people are called Midianites in, in chapter 37 and verse 28, and they're called Medianites. That's another parallel. Both son, they're both sons of Keturah, of, of Abraham, um, in, in verse 36. So it's apparently a traveling caravan of both Midianites and Medianites, which are not sons of Ishmael, by the way. But the term Ishmaelite tends to be a catch-all for these other, uh, the, these descendants of both Hagar and Keturah. Understand? So just because they call them Ishmaelites doesn't mean they're sons of Ishmael. People get confused by that. That's a, a label. It's sort of a collective. It's used that way in the scripture. Because Ishmaelites technically were descendants of Hagar from chapter 16, you may recall. And the Midianites and the, uh, were, from, were from Keturah in chapter 37 and also in 25. So uh, it's a general designation. And so, by the way, if you are at Dothan, it's very easy to see. You could actually see in the distance. You can see the carrot. You could see see them uh, 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 in the, uh, on the plain, because it crosses from the from the Jordan across to uh, the south on the south side of the mountain Galboa. So this all fits the topography. And they were with spice. Let's see. They were carrying bearing spicery and balm and myrrh. Those were elements that uh, the spicery came from India and a balm from Gilead, the balm of Gilead from the balsam tree. And of course, myrrh was a, 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 a spice that, you, that gave its fragrance by crushing. These all three were in great demand in Egypt because of why? Anyone know? Good for you. Yes, they're used for embalming. And that's, that's a major industry in Egypt. So uh, this is, it's interesting that uh, that's anyway, part, of the, part of the background here. Anyway, they say, come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our own brother in our flesh. <laughs> and his brethren were content. You know, we're not going to kill him. We'll sell him into slavery, because after all, he's our brother, you know. <laughs> I, uh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I'm not trying to mean that, because it certainly is less, uh, you know, than actually taking his life. And yet, um, <laughs> anyway, it speaks for itself. Um, then... Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And uh, now this is, you know, obviously you can begin to see a couple of things here. Here's Joseph. He's got a, a, a robe that people are after. That's exactly, remember Jesus on the cross. They cast lots for his vesture. Um, here's a, he, here he is uh, betrayed by his brothers. He came into his own, his own received him not, and so on. Um, and he's betrayed. He said, gee, why wasn't he betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? Wouldn't that have fit perfectly? Can any, tell, any, anyone tell me why it, it's 20 and not 30? Colossians tells you that in Jesus he'll be preeminent in all things. Okay, so I'll just use that as my refuge, as a, you know, Colossians 1.18. But uh, in any case, so he actually gets sold into slavery. Now Reuben, in the meantime, he apparently was away because Reuben returns to the pit. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. He was really upset because Reuben apparently had his heart set on being able to deliver the kid back home. And he returned to his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped 
the coat in blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This we found. Know, no, know now whether it be thy son's coat or not. Gee, do you think it's his coat? And obviously it's his coat. You know. And he knew it. He said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes, and put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days." And uh, it's really, uh, again, a form of deceit that's, that's ironic. Because Jacob had deceived his own father, Isaac, using his brother's tunic and the skins of a goat. See the parallels. Here again, it's the tunic of the brothers. It's, it's, uh, it's the skin of a goat as part of the, the uh, emblems that are being uh, employed here. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. And thus his father wept for him. The word, by the this is a mistranslation. The word is not grave. I want you to be sensitive to the distinction between the grave and Sheol. A grave is the abode of the body. You can own a grave. You can sell a grave. It's a physical thing. Sheol is the abode of the departed spirits. No one can own, and there's one, there's not many. There are many graves, there's one Sheol. It has two compartments, we learned from Luke 16. And uh, uh, it's interesting that it's spoken of there by Jesus himself as Abraham's bosom. That's the good side of, of Sheol, which in the Greek would be the Hades. Sheol and Hades are not Gehenna. That's a whole different thing. This is, uh, it, Hades is often translated hell in our Bibles. No, it's Hades. Gehenna is what we think of as hell. It's that, uh, Hades is temporary. It's going to be cast into hell ultimately. But anyway, the point is, he, here's Jake. He says, I will go down into Sheol unto my son. He expects to be with his son in Sheol. We learn from Luke 16 that people in Sheol are conscious. They're very aware. The rich man that's in Sheol is in torment, but he's very aware of Lazarus, who's also in the good part of Sheol, in Abram's bosom. So there's an awareness. It's interesting, too, that there's no repentance. He, he, there's an acknowledgment of their sin. The, he rec the, the rich man there understands. There's a lot you can learn by restudying Luke 16 carefully. In any case, this is Jacob's model. This is what he understands. He'll be with uh, I'll go to the, uh, unto the grave, uh, unto Sheol, unto my son, mourning. And thus his father wept for him. Jacob is really upset. I want you to understand Jacob's heart because it's going to be very material in the subsequent chapters as the whole drama of Joseph unfolds. And then it goes on and says, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt. Now notice, the, here, here again we have Midianites and Midianites, are labels in the scriptures. Though the Ishmaelites is sort of a collective, connotative term. They're not using it denotatively, they're using it connotatively or suggestively. And so Midianites clearly are not sons of Ishmael, they're sons of Keturah, as I mentioned. But anyway, the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Now, he, uh, the word in the Hebrew implies a eunuch, but you want to be careful with that term. Often, senior officials at court were castrated to be eunuchs in certain roles. But the term doesn't necessarily mean castrated. It means an officer of the court is what the term actually means. This, this the Potiphar has a wife, as we'll see, who's very much in the story. And uh, so uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it can be chamberlains, it can be courtiers, it can be uh, officers of different kinds. Now, he was a captain. Now, the term captain here isn't the way you, we use the term, but he's the chief official. He's the chief of the execution, executioners. It could be the chief of the slaughtermen, people who, slaughter, who were responsible for killing the animals for, for the sacrifice and that sort of thing. And by some uh, uh, careful scholarship, by certain commentaries, this was probably about 1898 B.C. I don't hang too tightly to chronologies because I've got dozens of studies, all detailed, all different, varying not by a lot, but still there's, you know, that, that's, a, that's a tough area to get into for you're, you're immersed in all kinds of technicalities very quickly. But there, anyway, to give, to give you a rough feeling, this is called 1900 B.C. roughly. And uh, that, uh, so that, that, the way they do that, they date from t Solomon's temple back and, and try to work it that way. But in any case, uh, we're now at chapter 38. Now, we're going to pick up in chapter 39 the whole tale of Joseph again, because he's in Egypt. But in the meantime, we have chapter 38. And many people are puzzled, why is it here? 
Well, I never use the word why in the scripture together too much because that's God's purpose. But there's certainly this, there's a strange event that occurs with Judah and Tamar. Not only is it a strange event, but it turns out to be very important for your perspective of the, the whole Bible. It's not just a little sordid tale. It has some other implications. So let's jump into it. It came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned in to a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. Now this is a pagan friend of his. He's an Adullamite, but he's a good buddy of, of Judah here. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her. So in other words, he took a Canaanite wife. That's his first mistake. They weren't supposed to do that. But you can tell they weren't, you know, walking by the word. Uh, these, these brothers, the sons of Jacob, are an unruly bunch, as you've already seen by their conduct. Anyway, he takes a, he takes a Canaanite, a pagan wife, name was Shua, and he took her and went into her, and she conceived and bare a son, and called his name Er. And that's what he does. He errs. She conceived again and bare a son and called his name Onan. And she again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. So now he's got three sons by this pagan wife. And he was at Chesib when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. So Ur is his son. So Tamar is his daughter-in-law. Okay? But verse 7 tells us that Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. We have no idea what it was that he did wrong, and we have no idea uh, how he died, specifically. But w what we need to know is what's here. That he, did, he was wicked, and God took him. So Ur is out of the picture, which gives rise to the rest of the tale. And Judah said to Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. This is an allusion to what's called Leverite marriage. We'll talk about that in a minute, because it's going to get, it was the practice in these days, but it also gets codified in the Torah under Moses later. This is Genesis, that happens in Deuteronomy 25. Okay? But the idea was that when you had a situation like this where the husband died without issue, that there'd be no inheritance. So the brother of the dead was, had, didn't have the obligation, uh, he, he wasn't rigid, but he, his responsibility was to take her to wife, raise up seed to the dead son. This turns out to be very important in a number of places in the scripture. You need to understand Leverite marriage. It doesn't come, it doesn't come from the word Levi, it comes from the Latin, the word Leverite marriage comes from the Latin, which means the husband's brother, is what the term comes from strangely. Anyway, so what Judah, the father, says to his second son here, he says to Onan, take, take her and raise up seed. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. It came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. So he, he, <laughs> he took advantage of the social custom to satisfy his lust. But he made sure that he spilled his seed on the ground so there would be no issue, which is bizarre in a sense. See, if you're going to do it, okay, let her have the kid. I mean, you know, that's her thing. But see, that's, he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to, so he spilled on the ground. So, and so this thing, of course, displeased the Lord. So wherefore, he slew him also. Big mistake, Onan. Shouldn't have done that. So I love a right marriage. As I say, it comes from Lavir, husband's brother in Latin. It's codified in the Torah in Deuteronomy 25. The reason I want you to really be aware of this, it's very important when you get to the book of Ruth, because the book of Ruth is a fabulous little tiny four chapter book that's probably the most important book in the Old Testament for the church. Strangely enough, that may sound like a contradiction in terms, that there's, the church was hidden. The fact that Gentiles be saved is not hidden in the Old Testament, but the mystical church was hidden in the Old Testament. Paul in Ephesians 3 has the privilege of revealing that to us. And Jesus makes allusions to it in a strange way in Matthew 13. But in any case, the book of Ruth turns out to be just a gem. But part of the whole drama in the book of Ruth is the role of the kinsman redeemer in the Hebrew, the Goel. And uh, the kinsman redeemer in Ruth from chapters 1, just a little four-chapter book. And without, you will not understand Revelation chapter 5 unless you understand the book of Ruth. So it's an essential part of your homework background to really get, that, get into that. But let's get back to Genesis 38. So then... 
Meanwhile, understand Judah's predicament. He's lost two of his three sons. Okay? So he's not too excited about this whole program. He said, Then said Judah to Tamar's daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah my son be grown. He apparently is very young. Um, for he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. So she's supposed to hang around till the younger boy is old enough to marry. That's the idea, I guess. It, it gets worse. Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. And in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted, and he went up to his sheep shears to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. So, okay, um, Judah's now without a wife. And one of the things, don't misunderstand my rec re recording this, it, I'm not condoning it, but one of the things he indulged in was to resort to what was a religious prostitute. We're talking pagans here. And, um, and higher, uh, so they're up. Sheep shear now, the sheep shearing thing was a party. The sheep shearing se season, which usually occurs at the end of March, um, it's spent uh, with more than the usual hilarity and, and feasting and the wealthiest masters through big banquets. So when it says going up to the sheep shearers, yes, they did work, but it was also party time. And he's up there with his buddy, uh, Hira, uh, up near Timnath, which is the mountains of Judea. Now, when they're up there, it's told, it's told to Tamar. By the way, they're up there having this party. She says, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And a party and so forth. And she put her widow's garments off from her, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. That should almost be put first. In other words, she's been waiting around for Shelah to grow up. He's now grown up, and she's aware of the fact that he hasn't been given to her to wife. So she's going to try to take things into her own hand to get a Leverite uh, uh, marriage, in effect. So, uh, she, in other words, if she can get pregnant from the family, it'll count, as in, in her mind. So, so, uh, when, so she masquerades as a temple prostitute up there, adorns herself with a veil, which apparently was the style in those days. Um, and when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot. And uh, the, the word is actually kedeshot. It's, a, it's like a temple prostitute. And I don't mean a Jewish temple. I'm talking a pagan temple. And uh, so she really is tricking him uh, into illicit relationship with her. So anyway, because she had covered her face, so she didn't recognize And he turned unto her by the way and said, um, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For obviously... He knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? He says, I will send uh, thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? So she wasn't born yesterday, okay? You know, promises are one thing. Give me something, give me a, you know, a pledge of some kind, that something worth more than the kid that I'll give you back when I get the kid, is the idea, okay? And so, uh, and a kid, of course, a kid of goats here. He said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, thy bracelets, and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And so, uh, by the way, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, seal, the signet, is probably something that was perforated and hung around his neck. It's a little confusing there because the, the language speaks, uh, the, uh, the word uh, translated bracelets is elsewhere translated like, a, like ribbon. So it, uh, whether, it was, whether it was around his staff or around his neck is a point, scholastic debate. But anyway, the point is that these are obviously identity pieces. This is like giving her his credit card, okay, um, with a picture on it, okay. So uh, anyway, uh, so she conceived by him. She arose, went her way, laid by her veil from her, and put back on the garments of her widowhead, okay. And Judah sent the kid by the, the hand of his friend, the Adullamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. Now, he sent his buddy with a kid to go get his stuff, and he found her not. And then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where's the harlot that was openly by the wayside? They said, There's no harlot in this place. He turned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said, There was no harlot in this place. So Judah said, Well, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. Well, it came to pass, about three months after, that it was told to Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. Imagine how that went over with Judah. 
self-righteous Judah. Huh? Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burnt. <laughs> you know, this is another time that Jacob's family is being deceived by deception. And uh, this time by a Canaanite daughter-in-law. So this is getting messy. Now you may say, I know when I first saw this burnt thing, I was sort of surprised, did a little homework. I find that the crime of adultery was anciently pu punished in many places by burning. You find it in Leviticus 21, verse 9, Judges 15, verse 6, and Jeremiah 29, 22, just to give you a few examples. Two of those three are pagan situations, but the point is apparently that was a practice. Clearly, uh, adultery and so forth was a capital crime in Israel, but it was also punished even in the pagan places if, uh, in, in, on occasion, and it was done by burning in those cases. Anyway, she's brought forth. She sent to her father and saying, By the man whose these are, I am with child. Can, can you visualize this scene? Can you visualize the self-righteous father-in-law ready to commit her to death for this act? Okay, who's the guy? By the man whose these are, I'm with child, she said. Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet, bracelets, and staff. <laughs> That's got to be one of those great scenes, you know. <laughs> Judah acknowledged them. And I want you to notice his perception here. That she hath been more righteous than I. He recognized, he recognized the situation as he realized it was her, that he'd been tricked. He recognized it was his fault, not hers, because that I gave her not to Shelah, my son. And he knew her again no more. Obviously, he didn't continue with her, but he did acknowledge her, in effect, gave her stature, and that the two sons turn out to be very important to us, surprisingly important to us. It came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. Don't confuse these two twins with, you know, the Esau Jacob and the other twins before. They're far more important. But here, we do have twins again. Something very strange happens here. It came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound his hand with a scarlet thread, saying, this came out first. That may strike us as strange. Here you got a midwife. She's giving birth. A hand comes out. It was very important to them legally who's firstborn. Because the firstborn gets double inheritance, gets all kinds of... That's, the firstborn is a title. That word doesn't just mean that he's firstborn. It's a title. Jesus Christ is spoken as the firstborn of creation. That doesn't mean he was created. That doesn't mean he's, you know, he was the first of many. It's a title of, of, of stature. Of premise. Anyway, this one came out first in the next verse. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore, his name is called Ferez, or Perez, which means breach. So it's very strange. The first one really out was the second in the line, so to speak. And there again, you've got some interesting issues here. See, by man's reckoning, the first one would be senior. By God's reckoning, the second one will turn out to be more relevant. I'll see you in a minute. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zara. And so uh, there we are. Now, it's interesting that um, all the way through this narrative, we have um, playing out some of these oracles that we've heard about before. You may recall that the line of Judah continued. You'll discover the line of Judah continued because of her and these kids. See, the line, the line of Judah had to prevail over all the others. Judah's sons are a zero. See? So this strange enough will be out of Judah himself and his daughter-in-law. He said, boy, this is pretty weird. But, um, uh, because, but because the offspring will end up ruling, ruling over the whole house of Israel. And uh, so, see, even his brothers had sold Joseph into Egypt, all thinking they could thwart God's design. All these steps are attempts by someone, maybe well-intended in a sense of speaking, to thwart God's program. And, uh, it, uh, uh, and here, even in Judah's own family, in his attempts to thwart Tamar's own marriage, we got God's confirmation of the principle that the elder will serve the younger. So God is reversing things here. Now, uh, this is going to be important for another reason. Now, I'll tell you something that's very, very strange. 
Let's stop for a minute. I, I, I've spared you a lot of this kind of thing in this study because it can be too much distracting. But I have to share with you this little tidbit. If for no other reason, you will not find it in any commentary you're likely to pick up. Okay. Um, this is the text of Gen in Hebrew of Genesis 38 that we've been reading. And uh, this, uh, this I discovered in a journal article uh, from the professionals from the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and Israel in 1987. I happened to find it in my library looking for something else, and I stumbled on this little tidbit, and it just absolutely blew me away. It turns out that if you look, there are three letters in here that are separated by 49, they're an interval of 49, okay? These three letters here happen to spell out the name of Boaz. Well, that's kind of interesting. You say, well, well come on, Chuck. With the 49, the 49, interval of 49, you've got three letters that spelled Boaz. They happen to be backwards, by the way. It's, in Hebrew, it's spelled backwards. I'll come back to that. There are also three letters. Bear in mind, Hebrew goes from right to left, so this second name comes next. And that's three letters that spell the name Ruth. Now, that's kind of when you say, well, this is Genesis 38. We're not even in the book of Judges or the book of Ruth with Boaz and Ruth and all of that. We'll get to that a little bit later. I'll, I want to review some things here. But that's kind of curious. Let's go further in the chapter. There are three letters, again, for always 49-letter intervals that happen to spell their child, Obed. 49-letter intervals, you got the second name, or third name. You go again, and there's three more letters that happen to spell Yeshe, or what we would call Jesse, the son of Obed. You go a little further in the book, you get three more letters that spell the name David. Now let's just stop for a second. We have five people here that uh, Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, David. Each name is encrypted by an equidistant letter sequence with the interval of 49. You've got five of them, but here's the corker. They are in chronological order. You're looking at the family tree from Boaz down to David. The fam no, wait, let this sink in. The family tree of D King David is encrypted in the book of Genesis in chapter 38. This is in the this is book of Moses. I don't care how smart you think he was or how clever he was in encryption. Did he know that Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, and David, that would be the line of the king of, uh, 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 of Israel? You see what I'm saying? This is mine to me. This, this makes my, my, my skin, my hair curl. This just blows it as you start trying. At first, it's one of these cute little oddities and that curious until you start thinking about it. And then I was, I was troubled. Well, okay, why is it backwards? All three names are in there. It, technically, on a computer, the, the interval is minus 49. In other words, the, the three letters, the names are spelled backwards. Well, when you get to the book of Esther, you find a lot of these kinds of things. And where it's back, it's backwards, some are backwards, some are forwards. The ones that are backwards are where man's trying to thwart the plan of God. And it hit me, just, just as I'm getting ready for the study tonight. That's, I think, what's happening here. God is not only declaring the relevance of all of these, and I'll show you some relevance that we have to come, but not only did he has them encrypted here in advance, I don't think you could have gone through there and predicted the genealogy. That's not, God does not want you to use these things for divination. That's where all these characters that write these screwy books are way off base. What they're here for is to glorify God in retrospect. We look back here and say, wow, God. You follow me? He gets the glory. But he's also got it backwards here because each one of these things, uh, the, this whole family tree thing, was what the house of Jacob was trying to thwart. Interesting. All 49 letter intervals, all in chronological order. You want to do the math on that, you're out in Neverland. You're out in Neverland. I won't bore you with the math. But I want to stop here because it'll have some other implications. Uh, we have, I think we've got the time here. I can indulge in a little bit of diversion. Um, I want to review with you briefly the book of Ruth. We're in Genesis. We'll be in Egypt. After that comes the Exodus. Then they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and all that. 
And then it's quite some time that Joshua goes in and conquers the land. After Joshua comes the book of Judges. At the end of the book of Judges, you have the book of Ruth. Okay? In the days the judges ruled, is when we understand where Ruth is. That's a lot later. Ruth is the ultimate love story in at least two ways. It's a love story that's studied in most college literature classes as one of the most elegant little stories you can find anywhere. Short, brief, exquisitely organized. But it's also the ultimate love story because it talks about the ultimate love of the Redeemer for you and me. And so at the, at the literary level and also at the prophetic and also personal level. It's one of the most significant books for the church in the Old Testament. Lots of important things in the Old Testament, but the book that turns out, surprisingly enough, to in effect be elliptically focusing right on the church. Because it has the role of the kinsman redeemer, and it's an essential prerequisite for the book of Revelation, particularly chapter 5. As you study the Bible, you discover there's always relevance to the tenth man. From Adam, come, you come down to Noah. Remember those ten? We talked about that back there. Then from Shem to Amram is another ten. And from Isaac to Boaz is nothing. So these three, Noah, Abraham, and Boaz, are key people in a biblical uh, relevance situation. Now the book of Ruth, chapter 1, talks about the love's resolve. Ruth, this pagan, Mo this Moabitess, clings to her mother-in-law. Her parents, her husband died, her, and so did Ruth. So we'll take a quick look at that. So she, that's her resolve. She really resolves to become whatever Naomi is. She's going to go and be in her country. I'll show you that in a minute. Then love's response to that. Ruth is gleaning and taking care of Naomi. We'll talk about that a little bit. Then we have a very misunderstood passage in chapter 3. I'll call it love's request. Love's resolve, love's response, love's request. The thrashing floor scene, which I want to touch on. And then the final climax of the whole thing is love's reward. The redemption of both the land to Naomi and the bride to Boaz. And so... In the days the judges ruled. See, the famine drives the family. These are, these are Bethlehem natives. Elimelech and Naomi have two sons, Malan and Kilian, and they leave Bethlehem because there's a famine. They go to Moab. And their names are very significant. I won't get into, It turns out when you study this book, every little detail has about three or four levels of meaning. So I won't, I won't get into all of that. To, to make a long story short, Malan and Kilian, who means unhealthy and puny, they die. That's part of the problem. They married Moabite women, but then pass away, as did Naomi's husband, Elimelech. And so Naomi tries to tell her daughters-in-law, hey, you got, a, you got your lives ahead. If you stay here, I'm going back home, because 10 years have gone by, and things are back, better back in Bethlehem. So she deters them from following her. One was Orpah, and uh, she, doesn't want to leave, she didn't want to leave Naomi either, but she finally does yield. Uh, Naomi must be quite a mother-in-law, because these, both these daughters want to hang on to her. Ruth refuses to leave her. And uh, so there's a famous passage that I had to include literally in here where Ruth says to Naomi, Entreat me not to leave thee nor to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest I will go, and where thou lodgest I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee in me. This is her commitment to her mother-in-law. Impressive young lady. The Lord rewards that. Well, the next chapter, it's, it was, you have to, part of the value of the book, you need to understand some of the ancient laws. One is the law of gleaning. Because of what they did in those days, if you owned land, you could have, your harvesters could go through once and only once. Whatever you missed was for the destitute. Widows, orphans, whatever, were, were, were entitled to follow the reapers and, and pick up what they missed. That's called gleaning. And so that's all in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 24 and so on. There's provision for the destined. Now, it, it says, she happened on the field of Boaz. Now, you, when you see that word happens, you have to understand how the rabbis look at that. Uh, they say that uh, coincidence is not a kosher word. Nothing happens. It's ordained of God. And indeed it is, because Boaz turns out to have some very important uh, aspects to this. His name means, in him is strength. And it's, it, that's the name given to one of the two pillars in the temple. So you can run with that one on your own. And it's interesting, too, that Ruth is introduced to him by an unnamed servant. Remember what we learned in Genesis 24? What is the Holy Spirit? He's always an unnamed servant. Who is introducing this Gentile bride-to-be to Boaz, the kinsman redeemer? Unnamed servant. Now, he, he, she catches his eye, so he instructs his weep reapers, don't be too tidy, leave handfuls on purpose. <laughs> 
he is going to be the Goel in Hebrew, a kinsman redeemer. And we, to do understand that role, you need to understand the law of redemption in Leviticus 25. I'll give you a quick summary of it in a minute. But you also need to understand the law of Leverite marriage, which is one of the reasons I'm bringing it up here in Deuteronomy 25. Well, that brings us to chapter 3 of this little book. When she comes back from this field, the only recognize she's got more than is reasonable. She smells a rat. Something's going on here. She realizes that when she tells him that she happens on this field to Boaz, Naomi, she doesn't understand, but Naomi does, that he's a kinsman. So she's got an opportunity here. Not only for Naomi, because he is entitled to get her land back that she sold ten years ago. But she also, Naomi also recognizes that Ruth has the opportunity to impose on him the law of Leverite marriage because he's a, he's a near kin. He's not the next of kin, but he's a near kin. So she recognized, so Ruth wouldn't understand all this. Naomi explains this to her. For the redemption of her land and for a whole new life for, for Ruth is what's at stake here. So she, Naomi, instructs Ruth on in what to do. And so Ruth, the, the scene that sets up the scene where it's the thrashing floor, and again, it's one of these places they all work hard, but then night's a big party, and after the party they all sleep. But the, uh, the way they did the thrashing floor, they would, it was typically a, a saddleback place where there's a prevailing breeze. And they would thrash the grain, and the grain, would, being heavier, would fall short. The chaff would fall further down. The wind would carry it further. So if you did this right, you ended up with two piles. The close pile you bagged for market. The further pile you burned to keep away the vermin. And after that was all over, what you did, you had a big party. But the owners, the top guys, would arrange their sleep near the grain to vent theft and so forth. But it was a, you know, sort of a camp out kind of thing. So came to pass at midnight. She's doing exactly what Naomi told her to do. That the man was, the man's asleep. He, she, she was supposed to watch where he sleeps. And when it was dark, no one's around. Neo, uh, Ruth was supposed to crawl up next to him and just sleep at his feet. Well, he came to pass at midnight. The man was afraid, turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He was shook. He said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Verse 9 is misunderstood by most people because it sounds like she's propositioning him for a sleepover. No, that's not what's going on here. You have to understand the background. She's asking for much more than a one night stand. The, the rank of a person in those days was in the hem of his garment. That's, just like we have stripes on a sleeve, they had a hem. On, their, their rank was on the hem. That's why David cut off the genealogy of Saul on his rope and so forth. The, the, you have to understand the skirt was the, uh, emblematic of the authority. God speaks of spreading his skirt over Israel, putting his protection, his authority over, you see. You follow that term, there's a whole, you, get into a whole, you can do a whole study on hems throughout the scripture. When the woman with the issue of blood, put, she wanted to touch the hem of his garment. Why the hem? Because that was in her mind the symbol of his authority. Anyway, what she's asking him to do is take her to wife to raise up kin. And the, next, the following verses make that clear because he realizes he, he, he's flattered. He's not, he's not, he's not, he's not, he's not going to copulate with her. Quite the contrary. This is a whole different thing. And at this point, you see this great plot unfolding because here's this handsome landowner. Here's your you know, gal that you're really identified with. And he likes her and she like, it's all going to work out. Except he points out, I'd love to do it, but there's one nearer a nearer kin. And that's where you're, that's, that's the plot problem at the end of chapter 3. Your face falls because there's somebody else standing in the way. And uh, you know, you always picture, uh, uh, if you're going to typecast this thing, you'd, ha you'd have Boaz as be, uh, I don't know, whoever is the tall super guy in Hollywood, but, you know, Charlton Heston or whoever. And uh, you always picture the nearer of kin as maybe Danny DeVita or somebody. Um, so, so, in other words, she's asking him to fulfill the role of a Goel. But there's a nearer kinsman in the way. And, uh, but he says, no problem, I'll deal with it. And he gives her six measures of barley where that chapter closes. Now you and I as readers wouldn't understand, what's that all about? We don't understand, but Naomi did. When she gets home and she sees these six measures of meal, she's Jewish, remember, Naomi. She, six measures, the seventh he rests. He says, that means he will not rest until this deal is fought. She, she, Naomi recognizes he's going to make this work. And so, anyway, chapter 4 is the big highlight. Boaz confronts the nearer kinsman. He's apparently the head of the city council there. The nearer kinsman comes by, and he has a group of witnesses. He calls them over. And uh, he's willing. He's, Naomi has some property. He says, no problem, I'll take care of it. 
And uh, he said, by the way, whoever does that also has to bury Ruth. Ooh, I can't do that. It'll mar my own inheritance. So he, he can't do that. So that, see, that opens the door. So he's willing to redeem the property. He's not willing to take Ruth as a bride. So he, the, the, the procedure was to, to, to acknowledge that he is not stepping up to his obligation. He takes off his shoe and gives that to Boaz. To the guy that's giving the shoe, it's an emblem of shame. To Boaz, it's a marriage license. So Boaz steps up. He purchases the land for Naomi. He purchases Ruth as a bride. That's the term that's used in the passage. But then as they celebrate, and see, you understand how Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. He is purchasing the land. The land comes back. Naomi is a type of Israel. The kinsman redeemer returns the land to Israel. And he purchases a Gentile bride to wife. You say, well, wait a minute. How can Boaz do that? That's against the law. You're not supposed to take a Moabitess to life. It's expressly prohibited in the, in the, in the Torah. But see, what the law can't do, grace can do. How could Boaz marry a Moabite wife? You have to remember who Boaz's mother was. It was Rahab, the harlot of Jericho. Most people don't put that together. Anyway, there's a strange part. As they're celebrating this marriage, and, that, and she's going to have this child, all this, it, there's a, it, what you and I would visualize as a toast at the party. They say, May your, let your house be like Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Well, it sounds like a great thing, unless you've read Genesis 37. You'd like to say, same to you, fella, you know? <laughs> no, you've got to know a little bit more. In the Torah, a bastard shall not enter the congregation of the Lord even unto his tenth generation. He shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. An illegitimate son was not allowed to inherit or be part of the, the congregation. He was asked to ostracize for ten generations. That was the way they dealt with it. Remember, every detail in the scripture is there by design. There's nothing accidental or incidental in the scripture. Let's take a look at these. There's Perez, Hezron, Ram, Abinadab, Nashon, Salmon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse. Oh, and who else? Who's the tenth generation from Perez? David. This prophecy closes the book of Ruth, which is in the time of the judges. Long before Samuel and the monarchy and all of that. Kind of fun, I think. Now, he's a kinsman redeemer. Now, to be a kinsman redeemer, you had four things. You had to be a kinsman. That's why it had to be a man. In, the, in Revelation 5, you had to be a man to step up and take the seven-sealed book, which is a title deed. He had to be able to perform. And in that context, he had to be sinless. He must be willing, obviously, but he, also, he must be not only able, he has to be willing. See, the nearer kinsman was able but couldn't. I mean, he wouldn't, I should say. But he also must assume all the obligations. That's why the guy couldn't just buy the property. He had to buy the, if he was going to step in that role, he had to do the whole deal. And the cost was very high. Boaz, the, he's the lord of the harvest. He's the kinsman redeemer. Who do we know that he's a type of? Jesus Christ. Who is Naomi a type of? Israel. She had to be out of the land to, have, to bring Ruth into the picture. Who is Ruth? She's a Gentile and she's the bride. Do you see a parallel here? In order to bring Ruth to Naomi, Naomi had to be exiled from her land. If she hadn't been exiled, it wouldn't have happened. What the law could not do, Grace did. Ruth does not replace Naomi. They're distinct. Ruth learns of Boaz's ways through Naomi. But Naomi meets Boaz through Ruth. Woo. Nowhere in the book do you find, until the marriage, Naomi talking to, Ruth, uh, Naomi talking to Boaz directly. He, she, he may have, but I mean in the narrative. You know. No matter how much Boaz loved Ruth, he had to wait her move. Ooh, think about that. Think about that. And it's Boaz, not Ruth. You know, the idea was, by the way, the law provided the widow is to confront the nearer kinsman. No, Boaz did on her behalf. Another subtlety, very important. Boaz, not Ruth, is handling the confrontation, taking care of the whole thing. Aren't you glad that our defense counsel is also the judge? Huh? Book of Ruth, by the way, in the Hebrew world, in the Jewish world, is always read at Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost, which we recognize as the birthplace of what? The church. So the book of Ruth, strangely, even in Jewish practice, has a link to that feast of the seven feasts of Moses that links to the church. And you can't really understand Revelation 5 unless you understand this book. So you and I are also beneficiaries of a love story that was written in blood on a wooden cross. 
that was erected in Judea almost 2,000 years ago. Great love story. But let's keep going with this. We have a lot of prophetic undercurrents going on here. David's, David's lineage is encrypted in the Hebrew text of Genesis 38, 49 letter intervals. His lineage is also prophesied in the time of the judges in the book of Ruth, 10th generation after Perez, and so forth. We go through that. Okay, let's get into chapter 39. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Now, the word Potiphar means one devoted to the sun, by the way. It was a local de deity. It probably implies they were at Heliopolis, uh, but um, we're not sure. It's, uh, it would be in the Delta region, which is, which is all reasonable. And some scholars place that this pharaoh is probably uh, Cestrus the uh, second, but we'll get into that uh, more when we uh, uh, talk about the, uh, in the book of Exodus, because there's a very interesting pharaoh that you, ha you, you won't find in the guidebooks. You have to get behind in, the, in Cairo, there is a pharaoh that they found who apparently died from, with salt water in his lungs. Um, but remember, as we go through here, Joseph was 17 when he was sold into Egypt. And so he took up his work at Potiphar's house as a favored slave, alien. But he became a, a personal attendant to this Egyptian officer. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. The fact that he was a house servant in itself was a favored situation. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hands. So this guy had, he, he was cool. He was cool. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had, he put into his hand. So Joseph emerges, and this is not overnight, but this obviously, he emerges into an area of prominence. It came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. For Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And uh, now he's probably very unusually attractive because he was of his, you know, from his mother Rachel who was also extremely uh, beautiful and well favored, I think the phrase is and fair in form and in fair looks in chapter, back there in chapter 29. And uh, came to pass after these things that his master's wife, that's why he wasn't, I don't believe he's a eunuch, master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. And he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against whom? Against God. Boy, we need to remember that. And it came to pass, as, he, as she spake to Joseph, day by day, can you imagine this poor guy being taunted day by day in the intimacy of that home? She spake unto Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie with her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in his hand. I assume it's an outer garment of some kind. Left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. He split, like now. It came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, <laughs> that she called to the men of the house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought into us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. This is the second time that Joseph's clothing was used to indulge in deceit, a false report. In both cases, he'd been serving faithfully. In both cases, he ends up in bondage. And it uh, came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which he spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Doesn't say to whom, by the way. I have a theory. I can't prove it. See, I believe if he believed her, he would have had Joseph killed. He was the chief of the executioners. He throws him in prison because he's got to take some appropriate action. But I suspect he didn't believe her. 
He probably had her figured out. In any case, Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. He rises to power in, 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 into the head of the prison. The keeper of the prison committed Joseph's hand to all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did, there he was a doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And so he's in charge. And this shows what a faithful servant of God, what happens. And uh, he, he remained loyal to God rather than to yield to temptation. And so God is going to be faithful to him, although it takes a while. Now, I run a little bit long, so I think I'll take chapter 40 and fold it into next session because I, I realize my insertion of the Ruth thing ran a little longer than I thought. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Interesting stories. Not only are they exciting narratives because of all the intricacies, it's going to get more and more colorful as we go in some respects. But also hidden underneath all this are eternal truths, staggering clues and, and that weave a fabric that is absolutely impossible to conjecture a scenario that it came forth by thing, anything other than the supernatural hand of God reaching from outside time. Because these things are in black and white, existing centuries before the facts. In such detail, they're de they're, it's just deliberate on God's part to leave us without excuse. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just thank you for your word. We continue to stagger at these discoveries we find in every nook and cranny. We thank you, Father, that you're a God that cares so much for us that you've gone to these lengths to lay out a program for our redemption. We thank you, Father, for these clues and these insights. We thank you, Father, for our Goel, our kinsman redeemer. We thank you, Father, that you've gone to such extremes that we might have life with you, that we might even have access with you tonight. We, we just thank you, Father. We do pray that you would reignite in each of us a new hunger, appetite, yearning to get ever deeper into your word that we indeed might grow in grace the knowledge of our Goel, our Mashiach Nagid. We do pray, Father, that you would also help us to be more fruitful stewards, that uh, we might too aspire to be like Joseph or Daniel, where we, the, the things we touch will be manifest your presence to all that are about us. But above all, Father, we pray that we might be more pleasing in thy sight as we commit ourselves this night into your hands without reservation. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.